uh, prayer request, Bert Cartier, prayer request you can send online to myself, arturasiak at gmail.com. That's at the website. And we gladly pray for your prayer requests. And also Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 o'clock online using Office Team links. We have online interactive video studies. We're in 1 Corinthians on one Tuesday and Thursday we're in Revelation. There's Tuesdays Revelation, Thursdays 1 Corinthians. And of course here with the ladies and whoever wants to join really, uh, on Thursdays at 4 o'clock here they have a Bible study here. So that, and tithes and offerings, you can send it to me through PayPal, uh, Zelle, whatever it is, or you can have it as a Dropbox or the offering to pay for paper, online uh, things, the website, and other things that need to be taken care of. So thank you so much for that. All right, so we're going to get started. Anybody who volunteered to read? And Okay, Ruby Red's going to have an opening prayer, and a scripture reading will be in Acts 4, 28 through 31. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together to worship you. We thank you, Lord, for another day on planet Earth. And we ask, Lord, that the words that come from the preacher's mouth would be your words and not his. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. And the scripture reading is Acts 4, 28 through 31. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Amen. Thank you, Ruby. And that was our scripture reading. And so we're going to now going to have our worship time to kind of to give glory to God. And so we're going to start with an oldie but goodie little bit of mixture today, um, contemporary more in some traditional. But when we all get to heaven, it will be a glorious day. I, I do believe. It. So when we see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. So we're going to start to sing that when we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace.
great day. The solid rock is the next sum. Our hope is built on nothing else than Jesus Christ. Amen? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what faith's about. And it's a precious song. Good song. The words by Edward Mote. Music by William Bachelder Bradbury. Sounds like a white Englishman. But uh, we're going to sing this solid rock. Oh, 
So it is in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, and the title of the message is Rejoice, Yes, and I Will Rejoice, Christ is Proclaimed. Let me say that again. Rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice, Christ is Proclaimed. And so, um, uh, and of course, we scripture reading, the scripture reading, the scripture reading will be in there talking about boldness, and we're going to look at about that for boldness. To present the gospel because Apostle Paul was in prison and he didn't say, Oh, poor, poor, pitiful me, I'm in jail and no one wants to care for me and this and that. But he used it as to his advantage to be able to spread the gospel, to be able to tell others, and even to write many letters from prison cell to different churches to let them know what's going on. That he is, even within prison cell, he was still committed to serving the Lord no matter what his situation. And we're going to see that today. And that's a little introduction as we're turning to, to Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 through 18. Um, there was a source is unknown, but uh, it's a, the title of this introduction is called Boldness for Any Audience. There's a famous Methodist evangelist, evangelist excuse me, named Peter Cartwright. He was known for his uncompromising preaching. However, one day when the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson at the time, Old Rough and Ready, he called him, came to Cartwright's church where the elders warned the pastor not to offend the president. So when Cartwright got up to speak, the first words out of his mouth were, I understand that President Andrew Jackson is here this morning. I've been requested to be very guarded in my remarks. Let me say this, Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he doesn't repent of his sin. And the entire congregation <laughs> gasped with shock at Cartwright's boldness. How could this young preacher dare to offend the tough old general in public, they wondered. Because after the service, everyone was wondering how the president would respond to Cartwright. Well, when Andrew Jackson met the preacher at the door, he looked at him in the eye and said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could conquer the world. End quote. Amen. Talk about boldness. Just because you're president, you ain't going to get any special treatment. Repent, son, right? You all better get right with the Lord now. Yeah, so uh, interesting. I thought that was good. Um, that's boldness. And we're going to see today, even Apostle Paul in his boldness, yet compassionate, yet in his love, yet in his service to our Lord in the missionary journeys and now in prison. He always wanted to write to these Philippians as we continue to see uh, the importance of caring and encouragement to the Philippi and the church there in the Philippians. So let's read our text today. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through um, 12 through 18. This is God's holy word. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, 
not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So let us pray. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that we are here gathered together, the few of us and those watching online and the future watching this online, whether YouTube or wherever it may be presented and stored and, and kept. Father, we just ask you to use this message to touch many other people, that people want to understand the importance, especially as Christians who are born again, elect of God, to be bold, to love others, and to bring the gospel message without compromise and do the good will of God and help us to advance the gospel, not only in our words, but by our actions. And Father, use me to speak as an oracle of God. We do pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord. Amen. 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 All right, the first point is this, which is on your handouts, is rejoice, for the gospel is advanced through situational proclamation. For the gospel is advanced through situational proclamation. Well, Apostle Paul here again reminds the Philippians of his prison status here and how he's persecuted, his ministry has been persecuted himself and advanced in the good news of Christ. And his situation was not a pleasant one at the time. Anytime you're in prison, especially if you're falsely accused like he was, and many times because of preaching the gospel, well, he was preaching the truth. He was not lying. He wasn't convicted of any crime except the crime of telling the truth of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. But yet his situation was not a pleasant one. And Apostle Paul wrote many epistles as a prisoner of, if you will, the world system. Well, Paul here didn't sulk in this situation, but took advantage of the imprisonment to what? To proclaim and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. Very important. He had what? The correct priorities. In his ministry call and putting the gospel first. And so Paul's perspective on eternal, was on the eternal kingdom of God and, and the principles thereof of the kingdom of God. You know, you know, Jesus spoke often about the kingdom of God is like a pearl. The kingdom of God is like a, a this or like that. He was always trying to bring up some illustration, a parable, if you will, sometimes, talking about the kingdom of God. And guess what, folks? The way the war was going on in Hamas and Hezbollah and Israel and Iran, and I believe we're getting very close to Ezekiel 38 war. I said it many times. I think we're getting very close to the Antichrist coming along. Depends on setting up a seven-year peace deal. We're getting very close. And I believe if you believe in a free trip rapture, it's going to happen very soon. So we may be taken up and meet the Lord in the air. So I think we need to be ready. And I think that's why, if anything, and at this time in the world we're living in, the way the last generation, if you will, before the return of Christ, the meaning in the air, we need to proclaim with boldness the call of, of God upon others to go there and tell others about the important. Even if it's in the midst of a time where Christians are being hated by the world, we see that. We see the, the advancement of, you know, desensitizing of the sin nature rather than preaching about holiness or, you know, the importance of being holy, the, preach, the importance of obeying God. And I think the church has kind of fell asleep, if you will. But I think the church needs to wake up, arise once again, and get their priorities straight, just like Paul, who was imprisoned, Christianity soon be in prison more and more as this time comes, especially after the rapture when many will receive the mark of the beast and it'll be too late by the Antichrist. So it's going to be it's a critical time we're in. I think because of that, Paul here is running to the Philippians, uh, even from this Roman imperial guard and all the rest of those who were near Paul, knew that Paul was all about what? He was all about Jesus. That was the message. There was no other message. He, he, he clearly defined in Galatians that anybody preaches another gospel, they are an anathema or be accursed. And he said it twice to emphasize that. It's important that churches now these days, and I'll tell you what, there's a lot of pastors and preachers in the pulpit are not preaching the full gospel message. They're not preaching the truth. They're preaching when itchy ears want to hear, to tickle their ears. And that's not a fight. It's not about satisfying those who are bringing more tithe money in or whatever. It's about preaching the gospel, and they will held accountable. If we want revival, it's going to have to start first with the pastors, 
first with eldership and the leadership, to get on the knees and pray to God and say, Lord, use me the right way and let me submit to you completely. And we're not saying that. In general, I'm saying. I'm sure there are many churches that are preaching the word, they're standing on the word, and it's important that we understand to preach sin, to preach hell, to preach heaven, and the alternative from hell is to come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ, accept Him as your Lord and Savior, become a bond servant, a slave to righteousness, and to follow His ways and His will in your life. That's a hard thing to do in our flesh. Religious systems won't save anybody. I love religious systems. I don't want to have nothing to do with it. We have a relationship with Christ, and that's what Christ wants, a personal friend. We, what a friend we have in Jesus, right? Like the song. It's about that relationship where he is our bridegroom, we have a bride, and we ought to be ready. I'm going off a little bit, but it's important. We see in verse 13, so that it become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment was for what? Is for Christ, is for Jesus. That's what he's doing for. You know, um, Keith Brooks, in his sermon illustration of the Bible and his commentary regarding persecution, uh, he, he wrote this, good work, for Christ never goes on without being met by opposition. The destroyer of men will ever be an adversary to those who are true benefactors to men. We may cheerfully trust God with our safety. End quote. I think that's an important thing as we know going through today that no matter what happens, even if it's death, we are going to be with the Lord after that. Just recently, just the other day, uh, Mariana works, she works was at Sam's Club, uh, a young man, uh, she don't work, he doesn't work in her area, but he was 27 years old, went home from work, and he just stopped breathing and he died. 27 years old. You never know. We are fortunate, like, uh, you know, uh, um, Bernadine, who could, old enough to be my mom, she said earlier, but, <laughs> but you know, but still, you know, as we get older, we get older, and, or younger, it doesn't matter what age you are, you're older or younger, uh, my birthday just passed, and I'm grateful I made it to 64. But some people like this young man, oh, he's just 27 years old. Pray his soul as he knew the Lord. I don't know that. I don't know your heart. I don't know his heart. But I think the important thing is, is that we have to remember that here while we're on the earth, as Christianity is becoming more and more attacked, and more and more people are being persecuted throughout the world, probably approximately over 160,000 people are martyred every year in the love of the world for Christ. I mean, this is a big thing going on. We are fortunate with the safety, if you will, for the present time in the United States, but I really believe that's going to change in the future. It's going to get worse. Now remember that Jesus said that, you know, if they hate you, remember he hate, the world hates me first. And that's just part of the being a Christian. Yes, we have to spread love, yes, but we also need to make sure we tell the truth. And I see many, many street evangelists being attacked by demonic spirits, and I mean myself, I've been attacked by demonic spirits, but greater is he than us, than he's of the world. We remember that. Second point is this. Rejoice in the confidence and boldness to proclaim the gospel. Rejoice in the confidence and boldness to proclaim the gospel. Well, how many have had such blessings of joy after sharing the gospel with someone? I mean, I just felt, wow, I, I was maybe fearful in the beginning. Some people fear, well, I don't know, Pastor. I'm not sure how to talk about Jesus to people or what do I should do or, you know, do I share my testimony? Do I, do I just read a scripture and leave it at that? Or do I just look like I do? A woman said, you're going to hell. And we're just, just right in their face on the streets. And, you know, there's different ways of approaching it. I wouldn't approach it that way. But, I mean, you know, there's, although it's truth if you don't have Jesus, but, you know, there are strategic ways the Holy Spirit to lead you. And so I really think that's important that, uh, you know, when I share the gospel after, I felt, wow, I felt good. I got to share it to, to not be ashamed of the gospel. And I got to tell somebody about Jesus, whether my family member or neighbor or somebody. And it always felt good after. They have this joy to rejoice that, wow, I planted a seed. Now, I don't know if they accepted Jesus or not or whatever it may be, but yet, you know, just led them, I showed them the message of the cross, which was very important. Well, I think today... Uh, for us, the, the, you know, there's such a triumph, a delight that one ha that has when, even in a bad situation, it can become a delight in rejoicing knowing Jesus is being advanced toward others. And that's what Paul's saying to the Philippi, to the Philippians. He's so rejoicing the fact that even in his chains, even in his, his uh, in imprisonment, the word of gospel is still going on. He's writing this letter. He's spreading it out. Look, how did he know that this letter we're reading, he wrote almost 2,000 years ago. We're reading it today. 
How many people have been impacted? How many millions from this one letter? How many people can you know that may be impacted by if you share the gospel with some young man, say 27 years old or whatever, and all of a sudden he's the next Billy Graham? You never know how much people we're going to influence by the way we approach people, our their demeanor, our words of speaking, you know. So it's a, it's, we just never know how the seed we planted will come to fruition in the long term. So I think it's important that when we proclaim the gospel, it's to proclaim the word of God, and that's part of it too. Make sure the word of God never comes back void. It divides soul and matter, bone and spirit, and it never comes back void. It always cuts to the heart into the, you know, to the matter of a person. And that's what's great about the word. The word will do the work for us. But look at verse 14 of our text. And most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much what? More bold to speak the word, how? Without fear. What, what, could, what, what can we fear man to do? What can man to do? You know, I'd rather fear God when he can do our soul, right? So we don't have to fear what man can do because Man doesn't have control over your soul, but God does. And I think it's important that we have this confidence. Confidence basically is mean to what? It's persuaded, you're convinced. And in the Greek, the word confidence in the Greek is pietho. And it's to believe in something or someone to the extent of placing reliance or trust in or on. To rely on, to trust in, to depend on, to have this complete confidence and this trust. So that's what that word confidence means. To totally rely, you're persuaded, you're convinced that you have confida with faith. You have this faith in knowing that, yes, I'm serving the Lord and I am confident about the words I speak, that they are the truth, they are the divinely inspired of God, and I know beyond any kind of anything else that I know that I know that I know that Jesus is Lord, He's real, and He's going to come back for His church. And we can be very confident in that. We can, I can't be confident in Buddha. I can't be confident in Confucius. I can't be confident in Joe Biden or, or Trump because they're both going to go to the grave eventually. So, you know, my confidence is who? Is in the Lord because he's the one that gives me the strength. I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Hallelujah. We're going to get to that eventually. So confidence is there. He talks about in that verse. And then he talks about boldness. In the Greek, that's talmao. It's to be bold as to challenge or defy possible danger or opposition. To dare. So, so you've got this confidence, you really extend, you believe this, you're relying to trust in the Lord to give you that confidence, and then this boldness comes along and it challenges us to defy even danger, the possible danger. And that's where Paul faces his positions at, where he's at. And then he talks about there what? In verse 14, the third thing, without fear, fearlessness. In the Greek, is remember the word phobia? You heard of, you know, acronophobia, the fear of spiders, or, or claustrophobia. Well, that word comes from the Greek word phobos. And without fear, fearlessness is aphobos. So the R in front of it makes it the negative aspect of fear. So he's saying to be fearlessness, without fear. So aphobos. So here is the importance of the eldership or leadership example of Paul was so needed to encourage the Philippians to do as he did. He was confident, he was bold, and he was not, did not fear man what he would do. But he was willing to do whatever it took to bring the gospel to the guards there, to the imprisonment workers, and to people around them. And what a great influence he did have on those people. So he writes, and he rejoices, Paul, in knowing that the gospel is advanced without fear and with confidence and boldness. You know, uh, boldness, preaching the gospel... Um, I found this out, I don't know the source, but it said this quote, The older I grow in years, the more my wonder and my joy increases when I see the power of these words of Jesus. I have called you friends to move the human heart. The one word friend breaks down each burial of reserve, and we have boldness in his presence. Our hearts go out in love to meet his love. Now again, it's that love of God that we understand how much he loved us he died for us he went to the cross he's given us eternal life and he's shown us his love and he's demonstrated that compassion for us that yet we, even as sinners you know we didn't deserve his mercy his grace his love and all that and his forgiveness but God gave us that through his son Jesus Christ and of course because of that we can be in that presence of God in the presence of God the Holy Spirit can give us the boldness the confidence and 
the fear of God, really, to go and do what God's called us to do. Very powerful. And you know what? We can all rejoice when we are bold to defend and bring the gospel, no matter what our situation. Point three. Rejoice. Only the true gospel is to be preached and defended. Rejoice. Only the true gospel is to be preached and defended. And, of course, we're going to see how St. Paul and some people had different motivations when it came to preaching the gospel, as we see today. Some people are promoting themselves rather than the gospel. Or they're using Christ, if you will. But most of the time, they're still preaching Christ, but oftentimes it's for their own personal gain. But we're going to see Paul talk about these in the next verses. Uh, and the question I have for you is, how many of you heard a preacher online or on the TV and recognized something strange or that didn't quite align with the Bible? I've seen it many times. That's why I don't typically watch a lot of evangelical these people on TV, on certain Christian channels, TV and stuff, because sometimes it's a prosperity gospel, sometimes it's a name and claim, and sometimes they just want to become more rich in their motivation, yet they are bringing some of the gospel, they're bringing some here and there, but I think we have to be ever so careful and use discernment and test the spirits, test these people, challenge these by looking to the Word of God and see what the Word of God says. Compare what they're saying to Scripture, compare me what is being said in Scripture. I think that's only important. And I think that's true because only I am responsible and accountable to God at a higher level as a pastor to preach the Word of God in season, out of season, defend the truth, apologetics. We're going to see that in a little bit. And it's important that we understand the gospel because, again, there are a lot of false teachers out there, false pastors, a lot of antichrists, small a, that are in the world, that are preaching another gospel, they're preaching something else, and again, they will be a curse for that, and we have to test those things. And people, so many cults of their people are getting misled, deceived into another gospel. Well, uh, and think about this too, how about the rivalry, of, a rivalry among pastors and even churches? You know, we've seen uh, some little towns, so sometimes they'll have a United Methodist Church on that corner, and then a kitty corner, the next corner across the street has got the, the Baptist Church, and then over here they got the Methodist Church, and you might have three churches on one corner, and I've seen that. It's crazy. And they're all, you know, the bottom line is they're supposed to stand on the essentials, the gospel of Christ, but because of non essentials and division, and, 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 and because of that problem of maybe following a man instead of following Christ, you will have certain times that there'll be rivalries among churches and pastors. And that necessarily is not good, but yet, well, we just praise God too that they're going to church, if you will. So what happened to true goodwill, good intention in preaching? Well, we're going to see here Apostle Paul writing the importance and the responsibility, not only of the eldership, but the believers to distinguish between selfish ambition, selfish gain, and the true gospel presented in love. Very critical and important. So Paul writes to the Philippians to express the overall premise of the importance of solid biblical preaching and teaching that the importance of Christ is being what? Proclaimed, even if some of the preaching is for selfish gain and self-promotion. Well, let's look at verse 15 through 18. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it and out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. So here again, Paul in prison, in this imprisoned state, knew the importance of defending the gospel and delivering the gospel with what? With an intention of doing it from a loving, good, good heart, a sincere God glorifying gospel. It wasn't about Paul. It wasn't about, you know, him. It was all about Christ. It was all about the good news. It was all about the importance that the king has come once. He's going to come back again. Are we ready? Are we ready to receive the bridegroom, we as the church bride? And if not, well, it's time to receive God's grace, receive forgiveness of sin, realize we're sinners, repent of sin, turn from that sin, turn to Christ, and then we're part of His kingdom, which is going to come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's important that we understand the kingdom perspective, and all about the Bible is all about God's kingdom, period. And it all points to the necessity of the Savior. Every person in the Bible failed God one way or another because it says clearly they're all sinners. David had Uriah killed. He had, a, he had a, an affair with Bathsheba, but yet he was God's, you know, the, he was the he was a, a apple of his eye and he was the favorite of God, David was. I forgot the words I'm trying to find, but... But, uh, but you can see that even David, who messed up, still was in God's grace. 
Grace is defined throughout the Bible. Almost every book of the Bible talks about it a little bit somehow. You can see God's grace, God's favor, and God's God's uh, careful, uh, not word, but God's compassion, God's love for these people, and God's kindness when they, we didn't deserve it. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve hell. But because of God's mercy and His love, says, you know, I'm going to bring these people who love me, who walk by faith and not by sight. They're going to be part of my kingdom. And this is important that knowing that people, when they preach the word of God, as Apostle Paul saying, be careful with them. Do it out of love. Because why? Because we need to defend the gospel. Love and truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. But when we proclaim it in love, people are going to get offended. People are going to, you know, preachers should be stepping on toes. And sometimes that happens. But it's going to either tell us or help us to, in our mindset, in our hearts, to repent, turn from the sin, to receive the word, or reject it and not repent. And I'm going to do it on my own and that's it. You know, and I should get to heaven. Well, people are very deceived out there. They say, well, I'm a good person. Really? The Bible says none of us are good. No, not one. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of God's word. So verse 16, we see that Paul is saying a word defense. In the original Greek, that word is apologia. To speak on behalf of oneself or, or, or others against accusations presumed to be false. To defend oneself. So apologia, we get the word in English, apologetics, which we see in the Bible. That means apologetics is basically, it's a uh, discipline of defending religious doctrines through systematic argumentation and discourse per Wikipedia. So that's what it is. You're defending the gospel. So we use apologetics to defend the gospel. Say, for example, you compare the gospel of Christ to Buddhism or to, to the Islam. And so you defend the gospel through apologetics and say, well, here's the major differences. Here's the difference in that. And so we speak on others against these accusations to defend the doctrines through systematic argumentation, if you will, or, or reasoning together. So in verse 27, excuse me, 17, Paul states that pretenders, I call them, were willing to verbally attack Paul in his ministry while in prison. We see that. From our submission, not to say, but thinking to afflict me and my imprisonment. So, so many people, they were so bad that they wanted to attack Paul, even trying to preach the gospel, they were accusing him, attacking him. He was getting it from all directions, if you will. And yet he was willing to continue to serve God no matter what. And so again, but then, of course, we know that that would not stop Paul in his apologia, his defense. So for even Paul knew that he was going to rejoice, again, this is all about rejoicing in the fact that what? Christ is proclaimed. And this was the important matter regarding the apologetic defense of Christ and his good news. Praise God. So often, you know, we have witnessed many in history and today on TV or on the internet preaching a pretensive gospel, a gospel that proclaims self or a man-made ministry, often utilizing deceptive, selfish gain, even bribery. Well, I want to share this thing by Harry Emerson Fostick, and he talked about uh, regarding defense or defending the gospel. Uh, he wrote this, The Great Wall of China is a gigantic structure. I don't know if anybody, anybody been to the Great Wall of China. That's one of my bucket lists to go see the Great Wall of China, right? Well, it's this huge, you know, gigantic structure which costs an immense amount of money and labor. I mean, it's miles, thousands, miles, whatever, it's long, this wall, right? Well, when it was finished, it appeared to be impregnable. It was a kind of a defense to keep the people out of from the wall, right? But the enemy breached it, not by breaking it down or going around it. They did it by bribing the gatekeepers. Think about that. I think that's important when it comes to defending us and the gospel. And there are pastors and preachers who, you know, it's about the money. What motivates them? What are they doing it for? Are they doing it to please God, to bring the gospel in truth, or are they pleasing with itchy ears, want to be tickled ears to hear? And I think today it's important that we defend the gospel, we preach the gospel, whether we testify of our own testimony or we share the gospel news of Christ one way or another through a certain different kind of mean, means of presenting the gospel. But I think it's important that we stand on the truth and we understand the scriptures and we need to know and study the word of God. We need to read our word every day. When we get up, when I get up, I get into my word. I have my daily reading. It's, it's once you go 
through the Bible all in a year. I've been doing it for every year, many years now. And I read my scriptures that they assign me. And I meditate and I say, thank you, Lord, for starting this day. I can go about the day. I've got the word of me. I've been fed spiritually. Now I go eat my breakfast and get physically fed. And then I can face the world no matter what brings it about, whether I've been attacked or whether it's a good day or a bad day. I know on this thing that I know, I know, I know that I'm a child of God. I make mistakes. I'm a sinner just like all of us. I, I mess up. There are things that happen in my life that, you know, sometimes I, I, I screw up. But, you know, God is forgiving. I, I get convicted by the Holy Spirit. I speak to the Lord and say, Lord, I pray, Father, forgive me. I have sinned. I, I just messed up. And, and I, I'm just trying to do the best I can. And that's all God wants us to do. He knows we're going to make mistakes. It's our human nature. It's our flesh. But we know that there's somebody, there's somebody. Our fathers or parents might have let us down sometimes in our lives when we were younger and as we grew. But you know, God never lets us down. He's always there to love us and to forgive us if we just call upon Him for forgiveness. And that's what people can do today. We first need that relationship with the Lord Jesus. We need to have discernment. We need to have apologetics. In other words, to defend the gospel. And yet we see that, as Apostle Paul said, there's other people with ulterior motives who are bringing something else or they're, they're not truly uh, preaching the gospel. They're bringing the word, they're bringing about Jesus, but sometimes, you know, um, are they really preaching the gospel? And that's up to us to test it to the word of God, test it to the Bible. The, you can say, he said something like this, and he can say, well, where did it say that? I don't see that when he's reading it in Philippians. Philippians, what, what is he saying? Where did that come from? Again, test me, test everybody you watch on TV, test those around us because, again, there's a lot of self-motivational speakers without naming names here in the pulpit. We have to be careful. We have to understand what their motive is and what they're, you know, what, what, they're, what they're trying to do and what are they saying. And that's why we have to judge those things. We are to judge in the house of God. That's for sure. Those on the outside, God's already going to judge them and they're already condemned. God will take care of those, but we need to bring the gospel either way to either everyone and share the truth as best as we can. So, again, as the title of this message was, is Rejoice. Yes, and I rejoice Christ is proclaimed. And remember, we are vessels. We are instruments in God's hand. We don't fight God. Let us freely submit, and He will write us a perfect love letter, and He can use us to write a letter, if you will, to others around us and share His love no matter what, because he is, he, we are the instrument in his hand, and he wants to use all of us and use our gifts and talents to bring the gospel. Let's pray then. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you have given us a wonderful gospel, that you've given us this ability to rejoice, to have the joy beyond anything we can imagine of this world, knowing that Christ is part of our lives and the relationship and so, Father, help us to share that relationship with others, invite others to come into this beautiful love fest, if you will, with a relationship with the Lord, into knowing that whatever sin we've committed in the past, or today, or even the future, we know that the blood of Christ is all sufficient to pay for all sins, past, present, and future. So, Father, I pray for those even watching at home, those who are here today, that, Father, you would touch their hearts, and you ask, Lord, to convict them through your Holy Spirit of sin, righteousness, and judgment, that sin must be paid for. And to set Christ, he will pay for that sin. Believe in him, have confidence in him, and we all need help, Father, to trust in you further. In a world that's gone crazy, a world that sin abounds, Father, we know your grace abounds even more. We thank you, Lord. And we do pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You know, one day, we're going to fly away. I'm a poet, I don't know it. <laughs> One day we're going to fly away, whenever that day will be, remember, we never know. Floyd passed away here to sleep. I mean, we just don't know whenever that may be. So, but we're going to sing this song with the joy and rejoice that some glad morning when this life is over, we'll fly away. And we have to trust in Christ to do that. Let's sing this, I'll fly away.
you, Lord. Hallelujah. We're going to fly away, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your precious love, your precious grace, your precious forgiveness. That through your son, Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh, my Father, you are great. You are awesome. And we worship and honor you this day and every day to wake up and say, thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you that you've given us this beautiful life and the life to come, Father. We're grateful. Father, we lift up all the prayer requests that we have in our hearts right now. Prayer for those who are ill, who are dealing with this or that, whatever kind of suffering they're going through, Father. We just ask you to touch them by your Holy Spirit, bring comfort and healing. And also for those who are fighting spiritual battles, Lord, we just ask you to help us to overcome those battles. When we are weak, Father, you are strong. And so, Father, help us to overcome, to be conquerors for you, Father. Let us go now, Father, to serve you, to love you, and continue to bring the gospel with boldness and confidence and with the fear of you, Lord God. We love you, and we ask this a blessing upon all here and those watching at home. And we do pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. All right. God bless you all. Have a great day. You too. Amen. Thank you. And all the birthday celebrations. Yes, and all these great birthday celebrations for being older. I'm an old man. When's your birthday? Friday it was. It was Friday. Yeah, but we're still celebrating. We celebrate Thursday. We still Friday my work though. They flying everywhere, but Saturday my work. It says work today, so tomorrow we'll go up and have a nice meal sometimes. Say thank you, Lord, for another year. Well, I, I just I just came came in just a little bit ago. So that's why I'm dressed like this. <laughs> oh, oh, so I've been on that I've been on a trip with my Kids. God doesn't see and, you also. And, yeah, we look chart. He looks at chart. Huh? We have leftovers at yeah. one o'clock. Mm. So uh, we, the dinner last from last night. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, didn't what? Dinner was last night. I didn't know either. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, just, just thing, there's, yeah. We need to get together. Oh, how about that? Yeah. Oh, you were on too. Yeah. Oh. You know. My my brain hasn't caught up yet with where I've been. <laughs> my body hasn't caught up. Do you know yet. what I mean? I come I come in and I feel like I'm in a different world. <laughs> you know, just I hear you. you know, I'll I'll have have to, what happened? Where am I? <laughs> I will have to go to bed and sleep tonight. Well, and I tomorrow, hope so. tomorrow when I wake up, then I'll start. <laughs> yeah, it's it seems you, like you, yeah. you're behind a day, like two days. I'm behind about, about a week. I, I'm right, <laughs> right at this point. I don't remember what day they picked me up. <laughs> That's why oh, I, I knew I had a day. What day I was supposed to be packed and ready to go? That's what I did. So from then on, I've just been on following. <laughs> yeah.